Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Matt Barry, my guest here from freelancer.com. Um, Matt, I uh, wonder if we could start off by you giving us your take on where we are today in the world of work. Okay, well, I, I got a lot of insights through running my business, which is um, freelancer.com. It's basically eBay for jobs. So what we do is we connect up 19 million people from around the world, uh, employers who want to post jobs and get things done with freelancers who want to do jobs. And so our employers are mainly small businesses and consumers in mid to high income OECD nations. So these are startups, small businesses who want to get that sort of spark of an idea to turn into reality, you know, right. build me a website, design for me a logo, et cetera. And the freelancers are mainly from uh, emerging markets and developing world economies. And they get to jump on the marketplace, access a global uh, client base, and work on any sort of technical job they can possibly think of. Mm -hmm. And it's been a pretty fascinating business to run for the last seven years because you know, the complexity and the sophistication of the jobs over time have, have just gone through the roof. I mean, back, uh, back in 2009, when I got going, um, you know, the sorts of jobs you'd see on there were very sort of IT in nature, you know, web, web design, graphic design, copywriting. Uh, you know, translation yep. uh, and so forth. But uh, over the years, we now have 900 different categories of work, astrophysics, aerospace engineering, genetic engineering, biotechnology, uh, and it's crazy. I mean, you know, as, as software kind of eats the world and, and, and the tools enter the cloud and um, bandwidth and the internet proliferates around the world, uh, and the communications gets better. The, the sorts of things that people can do with each other uh, and in terms of the work they can do is just going through the roof. And, and it's kind of like in the, you know, the Clay Christensen sense of, of disruptive innovation. Right. I mean, it, 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 disruption's been used too much, I think, uh, out there. But, you know, if you think back to the early days of Freelancer, right, uh, you know, the internet really hit the developing world in a big way after the big BPO revolution in India, right? So um, it started off with, you know, American Express outsourcing, you know, relatively unsophisticated jobs to places like Bangalore, you know, call center jobs and so forth. That was through the mid 2000s. And then 2006, 7, 8, the internet starts hitting, you know, uh, other parts of Southeast Asia, the Philippines and so forth, Eastern Europe and so on, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So if you think back to the, the early days, you know, the average job in freelancer was sort of like, you know, build me a website for $200. Someone in America was hiring someone in India to do the job for them. And to be fair, probably back in 2004 or five, just before I acquired the business, um, you know, a $200 website looked like a $200 website, mm -hmm. right? But it was for a cafe or a shoe store. And the cafe didn't, you know, didn't have a budget for $20,000. They had a budget for $200. And all they wanted was a menu. They wanted a phone number, ability to have a, um, uh, to maybe take an order through a form and so forth. And that, that's all their budget was, right? But you know, through 2004, 5, 6, 7, you know, the freelance has done two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten jobs. It's getting more and more sophisticated. You know, the whole wealth of human knowledge went on to, onto the internet. You can go watch videos on YouTube. Mm -hmm. You can use all these you know, new tools and so forth. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Dropbox is available. You can you know, now transfer large files quite easily to each other. You know, 13, 14, 15, 16. I mean, last year, uh, NASA started using us to design 3D models to train the image recognition system for the Robonaut R2 robotic astronaut on the International Space Station. And France is from all over the world are making these 3D models so that the Robonaut R2 knows how to grasp and manipulate these objects as it does this EVA spacewalk. And that was last year, 2016. This year, NASA is using us to do a decomposition of a robotic arm on a free-flying robot. So there's like this uh, spheroid robot that blows itself around the space station using compressed air. And the freelancers now, and these are from all sorts of countries in the world, are, are breaking down uh, different parts and designing um, you know, the, 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 um, the motors, the electronics, the actuators, and so forth, right down to part selection. So just on that point, I mean, how, how much sort of business is coming from this very high end? What sort of proportion now? Well, this is a very interesting question because um, um, you know, we made a very conscious decision early on not to tar target large enterprise at all. Right. right, we were just purely going for consumer, purely going for small business. And the reason why is early on you'd go and talk to these large corporates, right? And it's funny because innovation in the olden days, in the 50s, used to be large, large enterprises like GE would do the innovation, and that would trickle down to the mid sized enterprises, and that would trickle down to the small business consumers, right? Today, 2016, it's the other way around. It right. starts with the startups. The startups have the great technology. The, the small businesses are the ones that can adopt it quickest. And then the large businesses are the last to adopt it. So, you know, when we started talking to the, the, you know, the big businesses early on, you know, you'd go along, you'd talk to someone from, you know, Deutsche Bank or wherever it may be, and they'll say, this is great crowdsourcing, you know, this is the future, the collaborative economy, the gig economy, we should be all over this. Mm. And you go have a meeting with them, and they'll be the VP, they'll go, let's get the stakeholders in, let's have a discussion how we can use France all through our business. And then you have the, you know, the VP of legal, the VP of HR, the VP of compliance, you know, and they'll be like, where's this work going? Pakistan, have you done drug tests? No. <laughs> have you done background <laughs> checks? No. Right. You know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You know, we love the concept, but we'd never, ever, ever move that work out to, you know, Bangladesh or it may, yeah. may, may be, right? The funny thing is, um, 
they probably said the same thing to eBay back in 1997, right? They probably went to eBay and said, you know what, you love this whole marketplace, you've got all these products for sale, but you know what, can we just have one central place? We can, we can get one invoice per month, we can go there for returns and RMAs, uh, just one point of contact, we can just centralize everything. And eBay probably said, no. In the meantime, they just bought everything off eBay. So, you know, we said no very early on to, to large businesses, because invariably what I'd say is, look, we love the concept, but can we white label your marketplace and take our existing network of suppliers and put it on the marketplace and just really have you as an enterprise software vendor? And, you know, we said we didn't, we're not interested. Yeah. But in the meantime, they're all using Freelancer. I mean, if we go into the database and look at Fortune 1000, over 70% of Fortune 1000 companies are represented by at least one person doing something. So, uh, in the meantime, you know, I think, you know, we're at the point now, I mean, NASA is, is using us, NASA's referred us to a whole bunch of other big, big, big corporates uh, and so forth. So I think we're at the tipping point now over the next few years, you'll just see the large businesses use it. Right, anyway. okay, okay. And, and on that subject, over the next few years, I mean, where, what's, the work, what's the shape of the world employment market gonna look like five, 10 years now? Well, I mean, what's happening is that, you know, if you think about work and the nature of work, I mean, back in the olden day when your grandfather went out and did a, you know, started his career, you know, he, he got a job and then he thought he'll be there for the entire length of his life and then he got the gold pocket watch at the end and that was it, right? You know, my dad would probably work for 20 years somewhere and then after 20 years he would, he would go off and, you know, want to do his own thing maybe before retirement. You know, I'm Gen X, maybe five to, five to 10 years I think is reasonable to be in a, in a career. Right. Millennials are like one to two years. You know, the freelancers are two weeks. Right, so they go from job to job to job, right? Yep. So they go, you know, I want to work on programming for a bit. I, I, I want to do some music now. I want to do some design. You know, I'm interested in this new thing with the iPhone. I'll work on that for a little bit. And it's, it's all more about architecting your career, you know, creating a job rather than taking a job, mm -hmm. right? And, and so, you know, the ability now, I mean, I, on my website, you can outsource a $2 job or a $1 job. Right? It used to be you could only outsource a factory, right? right? And then it was outsource a large amount of work. Now, literally, You've got you know, school kids in my website sort of outsourcing you know, you know, $5 jobs to people. Right? Essay writing. Huh? Essay writing. Um, I'm, well, I'm trying to crack on that, trying to crack down that. But um, yeah, all sorts of things. Okay, right, so that's, that's the, the sort of positive side. In terms of you know, uh, the application of technology, the, the benefits of technology going to a smaller group of people, what is the outlook for the, the regular job market? Well, I mean, I think, I mean, Thomas Friedman said it best when he said the days of being average are over, right? right? I mean, just in the general workforce, um, any job that can be described by an algorithm is going or gone, right? And there's a lot of jobs out there in the world where really the work is quite repetitive and it's just kind of pushing papers backwards and forwards mm -hmm. or entering data into a terminal. Like, you know, you go, you go rent a car at the airport, right? I mean, why can't I just turn up? Why can't I know who I am? Hit a few buttons, key comes out of the vending machine, yeah. or I walk to the car and it... There's a you know, NFC off my phone, and bang, yeah. I take the car away. Instead, the, you know, there are people on the counter who take all my information, they enter into these forms, they go back to the computer, yep. answer, sign this document, saying this. You know, there's all these jobs out in the world like that, right? They're not real jobs. Well, they, no they were value. jobs, but now that you know, humans are, are inefficient, they're lazy, they make errors, computers are very good at things. They're, in, they're very efficient. You know? mm -hmm. So um, you know, there is a challenge. A lot of those jobs are going. But technology is also creating a lot of jobs, right? If you think about the internet, the internet... You know, the web, 1995, 1994 was the year that really went mainstream. You know, in the last 20 years, I mean, this whole conference, all the startups here have really been enabled by the internet. Yeah, I think, but most, I think the most orthodox thought is that uh, the, the technology isn't creating as many jobs as it's destroying. I mean, there is, if you basically look at the long-term job, there's, there's, job creation there's, in the US, for example. Yeah, there's an argument either side for that. Um, I think there are definitely challenges, and I think that the, the challenges are that a lot of the new jobs are in the, the you know, white-collar knowledge economy. Right? And I think that the big challenge is, is going to come where, and a lot of this disruption that's been occurring right now has been with middle class jobs, which are white collar jobs, generally speaking. I think the big, the big challenge which is coming is what's happening with blue collar jobs, right? And that's with the increasing use of both robotics and also things like self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. And we just had the gentleman from Uber on, yep. the, on the panel. I think, it's, I think it's a phenomenal service. I, I tell people uh, when they do a startup, you know, go and don't try and make a, 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 do a business that's a, that's a vitamin, make a business that's a, a painkiller, right? Because a vitamin, we'd all kind of love to kind of pay for vitamins every day, but a painkiller, mm -hmm. if I have pain, I'd really love to, you know, I'd, you know, I'll pay whatever I, I can to get that, you know, that painkiller right now. But Uber's a narcotic, right? You get, <laughs> you get hooked, right? Once you use it once, you kind of, you, there's so, many, so much withdrawal symptoms trying to re remove yourself from the product, right. going back to the old way of using taxis, that, that, what have you. But I mean, think about what the future of that is, though. I mean, you know, self-driving cars are really the future of, uh, of where Uber's heading, and, and it will start with the, you know, the long-distance you know, trucking, uh, and, then, and then head to couriers, transport, taxis, and so forth, and that will all be automated. Mm. And the reason why is because it'll be more efficient, it'll be safer, you won't have to, it'll be cheaper, 
and so forth. But you think about the dislocation, uh, what's going to happen in the workforce around that. There's going to be a lot of people in blue collar jobs that will have to retrain and reskill in, in, a, in the knowledge economy world, which is, a, which is a tough proposition. Well, it's also very difficult for um, you know, the, the, the models for emerging markets as well. The emerging market economic development model has been based around the idea that you know, all of these jobs that we no longer want to do in the West will trickle over to emerging markets where yep. people do dirty, dangerous um, manufacturing jobs. They're going to disappear as well, so we're going to end up with the whole development model for the well, world. Well, the lucky thing disrupted. about the emerging, um, emerging markets are is that, is, is that like, there's a net influx into the workforce every year. That's a once-in-a-lifetime boom. If you look at India, for example, there's something like 14 million people entering the workforce every year. And so when people are young, they can train up into anything, right? Yes. So there's a lot more flexibility in the workforce. If, if you've got the educational infrastructure to do that. Yeah, but the internet, the, all the, whole, the whole wealth of human knowledge is on the internet now. And um, the general model is trending towards free, at least for the content, and paid for certification and so forth. And, you know, if you look at something like Coursera or Udacity, I mean, or even YouTube, I mean, YouTube, you've got videos and everything for free. Um, Coursera and, and, and Udacity, the video content's out there. Um, Sebastian Thrun, in terms of a certification, he's already offering a $7,000 online master's degree in computer science, but he's going to say that there'll be $100 in the future. Right. Right, so, so it's going to be a lot more accessible for people in, in emerging economies. I think, I think more of a challenge are in the, the more developed economies, right? I mean, you look at countries like um, the United States, the United Kingdom, you know, Europe, particular Western Europe, uh, Australia, and particularly Japan. Yes. Right? You've got these, these massive skills shortages mm -hmm. in some areas, particularly around um, engineering and STEM and so forth. You've got an aging population, and some of those countries, they don't do immigration very well. I mean, a, a fun fact, I mean, Unicharm, which is the largest manufacturer of um, diapers in, in Japan, um, I think three years ago said that for the first time they sold more adult diapers than baby diapers, <laughs> yep. which is a pretty uh, amazing <laughs> sort of statistic, it's right? It's a grim, so, grim future for all of us. It's harder to retrain that workforce that's you know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s and so forth to, 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 to be part of the active economy. Well, I think the challenge is, is, is re a little bit more simpler with emerging economies given the fact that everyone's so young and mm. you, know, you can train people when they're young. I guess it's a, it's a two-edged sword, isn't it? I mean, with Japan, yeah. it's quite interesting because most of the new jobs that have been created in Japan are being created in the service sector but they tend to be low paid, they tend to not carry any of the well, benefits. Well, in Japan, the, the Ministry for Economics, or what it's called, said they're short half a million jobs today in engineering, engineering. to power the economy forward. It's just they have trouble finding people. It's quite strange for a country like Japan, really, I mean, because it was an early adopter of, of, well, of all sorts of things. Well, in the 80s, they were, they were the, the technological leaders in the world. So where did they go wrong? Oh, I can't get into the macroeconomics of it. I think, I think where they went wrong is kind of where the rest of the world's currently going wrong, where you, you've... you've you basically got a stagnant in growth um, globally. You're heading into a, a zero or negative interest rate environment. And you know, if you look across most asset classes, I think you know, you've got oversupply and overcapacity in, in commodities, which has led to uh, basically a huge drop in commodity prices, which has impacted you know, businesses down the line that you know, rely on them. So. But it, I mean, just in terms of the, you know, the training of the workforce to make sure that they're, you know, they're... they're yeah, they're I certainly right. think education, particularly K-12 education, hasn't, hasn't advanced anywhere near as rapidly as it needs to. It's mm -hmm. still stuck you know, in the 1900s to a certain extent. Um, you still go to, to high school and you learn, you know, French and German and, you know, in some circumstances, Latin and ancient Greek and, and so forth. And, you know, nowhere, there's nowhere to be seen programming. All, all that's changing a little bit. In many countries, they lump in programming still with woodworking and, and, um, and home economics. Yeah, well, I think my, my daughter's school. So I've got three daughters going through school at the moment. I mean, what would, if you were their career advisor, what, what's the key advice you'd be giving them? I mean, I'd definitely try and have some sort of flavor of STEM in whatever they do in the future. I mean, you know, um, you know, whether it's engineering, science, you know, mathematics and so forth, I think that's where you know, the real opportunity is in the future. I, I mean, there's a lot of, the number of lawyers that have come to me and have, have told me how I, greatly upset and disappointed they are with how life turned out is, is, is <laughs> phenomenal. Um, <laughs> it's a shame, isn't you know, it? Uh, a lot of people, you know, I remember back in the 80s and the 90s, like there was a big push to go and get your MBA and go into business. Yep. Um, you know, the number of MBAs I've employed at my company is one. Uh, it's a deputy CFO. Uh, I think Guy Kawasaki said back in the, the dot-com boom, um, the way kind of you value technology companies as a, as a very rough rule of thumb was you get the number of engineers and multiply by a million, and then you subtract the number of MBAs uh, <laughs> and times by half a million, negative half a million. So, you know, it's uh, been quite facetious. But I think, you know, look, there's a lot of jobs, out, a lot of really interesting career paths you could take, but there's just not a lot of economic value you can extract by taking that path. I mean, I had a, a lady, a really smart lady who worked for me uh, up until recently who was, um, you know, went through Oxford and did um, advanced degrees in antiquities. 
and she was first. Uh, she was back uh, in Australia and wanted to get a job, and she was working in events coordination. Mm. Right? You just simply can't get a job. Yeah. Right? It may be a very interesting thing to do, but it's really more of a, I think, a hobby than something you can really treat as a career and actually survive in, in today's world. In terms of diversity, I mean, how do you sort of track how many women use your service? Uh, who use the company? Yes, mm. and it's huge in many, many countries because in, in many countries um, we actually, in some respect, um, emancipate women to work because you can just jump online and work wherever you want to work in whatever right. field you want to work in. It's not like you have to go and go through the traditional system. It's really, it's, a, it's very much a meritocracy. Mm -hmm. You jump online and it's just every job you do, you get rating, you get feedback, and the more jobs you do, the more you get rated, the, the more you appear in the lists, right? So it, it, is, it is quite phenomenal. Women are huge in, in a whole bunch of different areas on the site. You know, areas like copywriting uh, and a lot of the creative industries, design, right. very, very big. But how many women on your board? Three. Right, okay, that's pretty, that's quite a good representation there, right? But do you have normal... Well, no, sorry, total number of people on my board is three. Oh, number of women is zero, number right. of men is three. Right, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Very small board. I encourage you to have, <laughs> have a very, very small board. The number of startups, <laughs> the number of pre revenue startups I've seen with like 16 people on the board is ridiculous, right? Three is new. I'm a 760 million market cap company, and I have three people. And it, you can, for as long as I can, I'll try and keep it small because you can you can you can be very efficient in how you work. Okay, well, I've broadened yeah. it. How many women in senior management? Uh, some, not a lot. Yeah. Uh, we are very much an engineering company, um, so we have that uh, in legal and other areas like that. Unfortunately, not enough women get into 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 tech. In Australia, it's an absolute disaster. Right. Uh, in the last 10 years, not just have the number of enrolments in computer science down 60 percent in the middle of like this technology boom, but the number of women entering STEM has dropped, I think, from something like 25% to 10%. It's dropped quite dramatically. And I don't know why, we just do a bad case in, in, in selling it, I think, to women. But I think there's a that's good, good thing, there's a good representation, representation here mm. in terms of gender diversity, which is fantastic to see. Okay, that's great. Well, we don't have much time left on the clock, so I want to get your take on the big question is whether the increased automation, increased uh, use of artificial intelligence, you know, what is the long-term role place, place for humans? There's counter arguments. What's to, your uh, view? So, look, my view is, look, increasingly, um, a lot of jobs are going. You know, a lot of jobs that are, you know, as I said, described an algorithm will go. Uh, you have to move up the up the value chain and become, you know, the jobs that kind of rely upon you know, strategic thought or critical thinking. They will take some time before they get automated. You know, one argument from Peter Demandis is we're entering an age of abundance, and so there'll be enough food to feed everyone and do everything, and humans will be able to kind of just relax and, 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 and enjoy themselves and have leisure time, especially with the advent of, you know, with robotics increasing. My, my belief is it's probably not a very hard decision for, a, for um, an algorithm to kind of go, is this human wasting resources or not? Can we do the job better than them or not? And maybe, maybe we'll allocate less resources, i.e. food, to them in the future. <laughs> <laughs> On that cheerful note, I think we should end it there. Thank, thank you. you very much. Great, thank you.